everybody. It's the one everyone's been waiting for, the regulatory talk. So um, before I just go into the, the meat of this, com this presentation today, I just want to give you a brief overview. Who are we at AMI? We are the trade body for the mortgage advice profession. So we're here to speak on behalf of mortgage broker firms. And you know, to represent your interests both at government level and before regulators. So uh, we've built up a very strong reputation over the last 10 years, and we're very fortunate in that uh, we do get listened to. Uh, only recently, we've had a win whereby um, the FCA has agreed to push back a reporting deadline as part of the uh, appointed representatives regime. We were the only trade association to identify that issue and when we raised it, they, they listened to reason and responded. So um, I think, you know, our, our, we have close links as well with uh, government departments. So uh, Bayes, uh, we're liaising with them on the green agenda, HM Treasury, um, first time buyers is a hot topic at the moment. What does the next phase of help for them look like? Um, and also with DLUC, particularly at the moment on the, uh, the building safety crisis and how we can help get communications out to leaseholders on what support is out there. So, yes, if the, the stronger our membership, the louder our voice can be. So, today, what are the objectives? Well, I just want to give a very brief whistle-stop tour of what consumer duty is about, um, but also to ha help give some insight in how to assess the impact for your firm in particular, because this looks very different depending on where you're at in the market. So what, what actually is it? I think this is a really difficult one for our sector, because we've heard from the, from the FCA, you know, this isn't aimed at you. Um, this is aimed at targeting those persistent bad actors in the wider fin financial services landscape so that the SCA can become a more assertive and proactive regulator and ensure that they can take action before harm actually occurs. Um, so I think, you know, where we're in a good place, we have relatively, relatively low complaints volumes. So we're already doing a lot of the right things. So that seems like we don't really need to change anything. But at the same time, we're having to think of consumer duty as this paradigm shift. And I think where, where firms are really going to need to make big changes in our sector is on the evidencing side. So you're probably not already evidencing in the level of granular detail that consumer duty is asking of you. So the structure of consumer duty. Now, it starts with this uh, overriding principle of acting to deliver good outcomes, which is a departure from simply following rules, ticking boxes, focusing on processes. And uh, it's underpinned by, that, by three cross-cutting rules that have to be embedded into every part of your, um, your business. So the first one with act in good faith. Now, I think this one's a bit difficult because it is so blindingly obvious to a, you know, a good firm that, want, that does all of the right things that it's almost something you think, well, I don't really need to pay attention to too much, that, that one too much. But I think in practice, this one really comes down to the sort of integrity piece about not only uh, delivering a good service, but following through on your promises. So if you've set an expectation at the beginning of that client journey, making sure that that's followed through on, th right through the, the customer journey. Um, and also being transparent and open, you know, about, so mistakes do happen, that's, that's normal, but don't, you know, you're not trying to cover your tracks or put yourself in a good light, you're trying to always do what's the right thing in, in every situation. Um, and a the next one, avoid causing foreseeable harm. Uh, this one's a bit interesting because we lobbied to get the word causing uh, removed from the, uh, the consultation in the consultation because, you know, we're not wizards. We can't magically make all of the everything come right for the client. Sometimes things just happen. So we don't have complete control. Um, but I think one of the areas where this rule really will come forward is in the protection space, 
because even though from a client's point of view, becoming unwell or unable to work is, an, is an unforeseeable, because we have a whole protection industry designed to mitigate that potential, um, it's now going to be more incumbent on you than ever to ensure clients are remembering those protection conversations, they're understanding why it's important, and uh, they, you know, if they are declining to go down that route, that they're doing so from a position of being well informed as to what, why it would be needed. And then finally, acting to support customers to pursue their financial objectives. Now, I think this one could have been worded a bit better, actually, because having been, you know, in previous roles where I've sat in on client meetings, clients don't really have financial objectives. They don't really know what they want financially. But what they do have is, is life objectives that require a financial solution. So I think this is the one where it's, it's hard for mortgage you know, firms with limited permissions to be able to know how to navigate this, given that your compliance people are going to want you to stay in a box. They're not going to want you to be straying off into, quite rightly, into advice areas where you're not authorised. Um, and I think the way to square this one is actually kind of goes back to what Claire was saying earlier about the dilemma a lot of brokers are finding themselves in at the moment with, do you go with a fix or do you go with a tracker? And, you know, I think to, if you're looking at the wider client profile and if you have a client who has a pension that's invested in 100% emerging market equities or they're quite comfortable with the idea of their ISA falling by 50% in value, then that kind of, that story makes sense then if you're recommending a tracker mortgage to that same client. And then conversely, you know, if you've got a client who's uh, the most exciting thing they own is, a, is premium bonds, then even if it's going to cost them more, it kind of then makes sense that you would still recommend a fix for them because they're the type of person that needs that, that type of certainty. So in terms of the scope, the thing that the FCA keeps coming back to is this idea of proportionality. So consumer duty isn't something that you're going to be have to re, you know, you're going to have to rethink every time you sit down with a new client. It's something that happens at compliance level and at governance level. Um, so it's you're not kind of rerunning your fair value calculations, for example, every time you do some more client research. And looking as well about the regulatory, uh, you know, perimeter. Um, so obviously, it only applies to regulated activities, which does not include buy to let. Um, but I think, given the fact that if you're the type of business that does both standard resi and buy to let. One, it's probably going to be easier for you to apply universal standards across the board. But two, I think you have to think as well of those grey areas. So, you know, as we know, some, it's quite common for people to use their um, refinancing their main residence to get the, the cash to, to get a buy-to-let property. So if you're, or if, you know, if there's anything that you're ruling out in the standard resi space, Advising somebody not to do something is just as much advice, and FOS will consider that within their jurisdiction. So I think just to avoid the grey areas, um, it's, it's helpful to just sort of embed this at business, at the level of your, your overall business, rather than trying to, to tease out certain areas it may or may not apply to. Um, and I think... The way in for consumer duty, because this is so big, it's very hard for businesses to know, where do I start with this? And although we have the consumer principle sitting at the top and this very this thing that they're trying to drive home about evidencing, 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 um, you, it's, it's hard to actually know what that looks like until you've really defined your end-to-end -end consumer journey. So if you, if you put yourself in your client's shoes and think, what is this journey supposed to look like? What, it, what does good look like? What is supposed to happen? Then you can start using that information to measure whether you actually are getting those good outcomes. And, you know, and I think that's when we talk about gap analysis. And, you know, your, your hypothetical, here is what we're about as a business, here is what we should deliver, versus your, um, 
what we're actually delivering. Closing the gap between the two is, is the work that needs to be done, essentially, um, in approaching consumer duty. And, and the, the, the side of w whether you actually are meeting those can be both in the real world and it can be testing. So it could be mystery shopping or it could be, you know, asking, running communi communications by friends and family, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, consumer duty does build on a lot of existing areas of regulation. Um, and that's really going to be factored into how you visualize this, this consumer journey that you're going you're gonna to be setting down on paper. But um, I was in a, an FTA webinar yesterday and the question was, what is the difference between consumer duty and TCF? And they gave three uh, key differences. Um, the first one is that TCF is one size fits all, whereas consumer duty is, is tailored to what you're about as a business. Um, TCF is process focused, so as long as you're doing all the right things, you've, you've done your job, whereas consumer duty is outcomes focused, it's about the material impact you have on the consumer. And also TCF is more about does your audit trail reflect that you've done all those things? Whereas consumer duty is evidencing the outcomes. So it doesn't matter if you evidence that you did all these things, what was the actual uh, impact on the client? Um, and I think uh, just on this list as well, uh, I know someone's touched upon this before today, but vulnerability is a really evolving, expanding kind of area of regulation at the moment in that um, it's something that it, the definition is expanding. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, an inherent property of, of the client that you're dealing with. They might be um, temporarily vulnerable if they've gone through some kind of traumatic life event, or they may not even look vulnerable. Um, I heard a really interesting statistic about the reason that the, the, the all UK government communications are pitched as if they're written to someone with a reading age of nine, because that is the average person's reading age in this country and um, you know and that's not to say you need to start rewriting all the communications for nine-year-olds but um, if you are defining who your target market is you do need to be asking those questions does this serve who I have already said I'm going to be uh, aiming my marketing and my services at So just moving on to the, the four outcomes that sit beneath the, the cross-cutting rules. Um, the first of these uh, products and services. Now, I think this one is go, it's, it, it's kind of something that, if you think of it as a little bit like a business plan, in that you're defining your consumer, your target consumer, and then you're thinking about, okay, what is the range of, of products and services I'm going to... I'm going to kind of marshal to meet those needs. So it doesn't start with the product set. It starts with uh, who your audience is, uh, who, who your market is, and what their need, and then it will be dictated by, by their needs. And at the moment, we are seeing authorization slowing down at the FCA. Um, part of that is just through bringing more and more areas of the industry into the uh, regulatory perimeter. But another part of it is there is increased scrutiny of applications and a big strand of that is credibility so we've been seeing you know very experienced very well qualified um, good people who are actually struggling to to get authorized because their plan what they're put, putting together on this products and services from this products and services point of view is is too ambitious and um, you know, I think every time you add a new target consumer that you say you're going to serve, you're multiplying your product set because you can't just sort of have one set solution for each consumer. So the FCA is going to be looking at, is your business actually equipped to deliver these services you say you're going to deliver? Is it credible? And it's better to go for a niche as opposed to, if, and do that really well, than it is to try and be all things to everybody and, and fall short. Oh, no, wait, I'm staying on this one. Um, so price and value. I think on this one, the FCA has been keen to stress over and again that they're not trying to be a price regulator. 
they making profits, that's fine. Um, setting your own uh, rates for different customers, that's fine. But what they want to see is a fair relationship between the costs and the benefits of what you have to offer. And also defining it in advance. So I think one of the things that's kind of really seen as a bit of a red flag is if the, uh, the savvy customer is able to haggle you down on price, whereas the vulnerable customer then unknowingly pays full whack and it's sort of not, it, there's a post hoc kind of, um, you know, justification for that. So uh, it's, it's all about making sure that you're, you've got a policy in place on that. Um, consumer understanding, I think here, this is where evidencing is key. Uh, complaints data is not going to be sufficient. So, um, you know, you want to be looking at who didn't proceed with you, who, who, who didn't come back for repeat business. Are you doing that root cause analysis and finding out why? Um, and an another thing to have come out of discussions we've been having with the FCA and other trade bodies recently is this consumer satisfaction is not the same thing as consumer understanding. So, you know, if the con consumer's doing a survey because they've just got the keys to their wonderful dream home and they're so thrilled with your service, that isn't evidence that they've really understood what you've sold to them. And I think often understanding, a failure of understanding tends to come actually in the form of, of regret because you, that's kind of like, if only I'd had the understanding that I have now at the point of sale. So it's all about, again, putting clients in the position to make informed decisions. Um, I'll just try and go as more quickly over this last one because I'm, uh, I'm running out of time here. But So on consumer support, um, I think one of the things that I heard recently in, uh, in a presentation by the FCA was um, to make it slick. So is your, is your um, you know, all your business processes, are they all delivering the same type of experience? So, because it's one thing to have a really great onboarding process, an initial sales process, but is, does the consumer have the same experience when they ring up to make a complaint? Or does the consumer have the same experience when they, um, you know, they need to make a claim or they just have a general query? So the, the support that you give should be just as good whether you're standing to generate more business from it or if it's not going to make you anything. Um, so that's, yeah, that's that one. <laughs> and um, I think just as well, finishing off with, um, with evidencing. Um, there's a lot of anxiety, I think, around this one for smaller businesses because there's a sense that, well, I don't have big data structures and I don't have these powerful MI reporting tools. Um, but it, this is where it comes back to proportionality. And the, the test that the FCA has asked you to consider here is, are you putting as much effort into your uh, consumer duty MI and analysis as you are into any kind of data analysis that you're running to boost sales or marketing? Um, you know, as having, having previously been in financial marketing before, I think there's a sense of if you're in marketing, you're kind of like doing some sort of voodoo that nobody understands and uh, you just generate the sales and it's sort of, you know, it's all great. But I think on this, you know, if, if, if your marketers are kind of, if they're running targeted ads and selecting filters on pay-per-click and on social, if they're running A-B tests to see which advert generates the most clicks, that's the level of granularity as well you need to be going down to with your consumer duty testing. Um, so it's not so much that not failing to go into a certain level of detail will be penalised. You know, if you're a very small business, you know all your clients by their first names. You know, you can't put them, they don't even fit, fill a whole spreadsheet up kind of thing. That's not the problem, but it's, it's the asymmetry that's going to raise a red flag. Um, so, uh, yes, and then just finally on dates. Um, so obviously the, imp the first implementation deadline has passed um, and the, sorry for the project implementation plan has just passed. So your next one to look forward, look forward to, I mean, everyone's looking forward to that, is April 2023, uh, where you will get your, uh, 
hopefully your data back from the lenders um, or your product providers so that you can run your fair value assessments. This was a piece of learning from the, uh, the GI and pure protection fair value exercise. We needed those staggered deadlines to ensure the manufacturers are providing the information in time. Um, and then 31st of July 2023 is where everything has to be in force for your, uh, for your open products. And then the year after is back book. So we at Amy are currently working on some, uh, we've already released a suite of initial documents to help firms build their implementation plans. And we're currently working on a, a series of fact sheets, both on the high level stuff, so the, the uh, new principle and the cross cutting rules, but also how that interacts with things like SMCR and vulnerability, and then some product specific ones as well. So those are available to our members. And um, so, yeah, there's so much more to it than that, but that's all we have time for today. So um, thank you very much and uh, have a great morning.